following lecture was produced by Glorianne Publishing, a nonprofit organization, and is one of hundreds of lectures freely available via download, podcasts, streaming radio, and transcription. These lectures range in topic and complexity in order to address the many needs of humanity. We invite you to browse our library of lectures, books, courses, and articles to find teachings that suit you. Through the support of donations, Glorian Publishing has published 40 books, hosts international retreats several times a year, offers free online courses, and many other valuable resources, available to anyone worldwide. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Your donations make it possible for this free public service to reach thousands of people every day. To make a tax-deductible donation in any amount, even anonymously, visit GnosticTeachings.org. Now, with heartfelt wishes for the end of suffering for all creatures, we begin the lecture. May all beings be happy. In this uh, occasion, we are going to talk about more deeply about the monad and the relationship of uh, the monad with the universe and nature. As you remember, uh, in the last lecture, we were talking uh, about the interstellar elemental that we said is one of the parts of the monad. Before uh, going into the lecture, we had to give uh, an explanation about the monad. We said that the monad is the being, the spirit, God, within each one of us. It's a Greek word which means unity. Monas, unity. And uh, we state that the monad is a multiple perfect unity. There is a word that is utilized in Kabbalah in the Hebrew language that gives the explanation of what the monad is. And the name or the word utilized in, in Kabbalah or Hebrew language is Elohim. The word Elohim is precisely that Kabbalistic name that explains the multiplicity of divinity. When we read the Bible in Hebrew, we find this word in the beginning, in the book of Genesis. Unfortunately, the translators have translated this uh, name as God, as a singular name. But when we go deeply in the investigation of the the roots of this name, we discovered that it's a plural name and a feminine and masculine name at the same time. El, or the word Elohim, means God, the masculine aspect. And of course, we had to understand and to comprehend that this word El resides in each one of us. Every single person has his own El, his own God, as masculine aspect. But then we find the other word within the word Elohim, Eloah or Elohi, which is a feminine name, which translated into English would be Goddess. And this is something very important. Because we also have to know that 
inside of each one of us, we have our own particular goddess, our own particular mother, divine mother. It is something that is uh, ignored always by the monotheistic religions, which are precisely, and very sad to say it, because we are talking here of this Hebrew word, because the Jews believe only in one God, and is masculine. Uh, maybe the Kabbalists that they study that, but they don't uh, spread the knowledge. But I have many Jews friends, and they always say, that God is male and one. So, in Gnosticism, we learn that that unity, which is the monad, is of course multiple. So El, as Father, is inside of us. It's our Father that the Lord Jesus uh, uh, talk about in the prayer of the Lord, that says, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, etc. Of course, that is a superior part, we will say. Or as in the, in the Pisces Sophia, the Gnostic Bible, uh, it is written there that the Father resides in the first space. When we study Kabbalah, we know that this first space is known in Kabbalah as uh, the world of Atziluth. Atziluth is a divine world. But then, according to Kabbalah and Pisti Sophia, they said that the Mother, the Divine Mother, the Eloah, Elohi, resides in the second space. Of course, we are not going to go deeper into Kabbalah because uh, it's very uh, abstract knowledge that we have to learn with a lot of intuition in order to get. But the main thing is this, that this male-female aspect of divinity resides in each one of us. So God is not male, is not female, but both forces. But below El and Eloah, or Elohim, there are many parts of the being that we have to discover. And in order to point to that multiplicity of divinity within each one of us and also outside of us, we find the end of the word Elohim. Im. I am. In Hebrew means many. It's a plural ending. So then, if we want to translate this word correctly, we have to say that Elohim means gods and goddesses. In other words, the different parts which are related with the masculine aspect of God within each one of us, and the different parts which are feminine within each one of us, but all of them together is that that we call the monad, the multiple perfect unity, Elohim. Of course, there are three parts within this Elohim, which are the main parts, which is called the Holy Trinity. In Christianity, the Holy Trinity is called Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But this Trinity resides within each male-female part that we're talking here. This is something that we have to intuit. So Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, as we say, wisdom, love, power is within the Father. Wisdom, love, power is within the mother. 
You know? This is what we call the three primary forces that creates. As above, so below. Because in the physical body, these three parts are only manifested in the intellectual animal. Because remember that we were talking in the other lecture that there are four kingdoms in nature. Mineral kingdom, plant kingdom, animal kingdom, and the intellectual animal kingdom, which is wrongly called, or mistakenly called, humanity. Because really from the intellectual animal, the human being comes, or could come, and be created. You know? The real human being into the image of God. That man that the, not, that the Bible talks about. This is something that we have to understand. Do not ever think that we the Gnostics takes or take, I mean, everybody as human beings because we are not. And it is something that is always causing a lot of trouble in the minds of people that are studying Gnostics. Because they sometimes do not understand because they believe themselves that they are human beings. Mm -hmm. And I repeat, we are not human beings, we are intellectual animals. And the intellectual animal is the only creature in the four kingdoms that has three brains. The other creatures which are not intellectual, they have two brains. Uh, the motor brain, which is that brain that uh, allows the creature to move here, there, everywhere. The emotional brain, that it gives the creature, of course, the emotional aspect according to his level. And we, that we have, of course, the intellectual brain. That's the difference between the beasts, which are just instinctive, and with us, that at least we have intellect. If we take the intellect out of any intellectual animal, and then we have a gorilla, a chimpanzee, orangutan, or any other ape, and uh, very weak, because it will be in def uh, defenseless mm. against the forces of nature. Because the other creatures, which are not intellectual, they have class. You know, they are just very weak, physically speaking. But we have a privilege. Only we, as intellectual animals, we have the opportunity of becoming human beings in the complete sense of the word, of becoming men. And also we have to explain as well that when we in the Gnosticism we talk about men, we are not talking about the male. Because unfortunately, uh, humanity, this humanity is utilizing many names in the wrong way. They, they say humanity or human beings and they uh, title of human being everybody. And when they say men, they point the male. Human being and men is syn are synonymous. But uh, we can say male and female. But the word man comes from the Sanskrit manas which means mind. Someone that has a manu, some, somebody that is a manu, a man, that has human mind. You know what is a human mind? Or a man, in other words? Is someone that whose mind is united to you, the spirit. The monad, in other words. Somebody whose monad, which is the hue, is united to manas, hue manas, human. That is a human. That is a man, in other words. But if we investigate the intellectual animal mistakenly called man, we don't find there that the monad expresses itself through the intellectual animal. What we find 
unfortunately, is that through the three brains that we have, the intellectual brain, the emotional brain, and the motor instinctive brain, which is in the spinal column, together with the sexual organs and the instinctive center, what expresses to these three brains are animal aspects of the animal kingdom, which also are incorrectly called human defects. And they are not human defects. They are just properties of the animal kingdom. Lust, anger, pride, envy, vanity, gluttony, laziness, fear. We have thousands of defects within each one of us. Animal aspects. The only human thing that we have within is that that we call essence. Or that in psychology is commonly called uh, consciousness. But unfortunately this consciousness is but a lie within the ego. And that ego precisely it is, like I said, last envy, platinum, lesson, etc. So the ego is plural. That animal aspect of us, the ego, is worship in these times by many schools. They worship, they have the cult of the ego. The book of Revelation, which is a Kabbalistic book, called the ego in many ways, according to the center of the brain in which this ego is working. We call it the whore or harlot. It's called it, they also call it the beast with seven heads and, seven, and ten horns and crowns, etc. It's called in different ways, in accordance to unity, in accordance to, in, in general, with humanity. It's also called the Antichrist. The ego is called the Antichrist. So if you think that the Antichrist is somebody here that will appear, it's already here. And it's inside of each one of us. It's our beloved ego. Or as the Master Samael on the Lord says, that of the beloved has nothing. Has nothing of beloved. It's something very uh, negative that we have within. And of course, the ego is that entity that is destroying in each one of us the possibility of the human being to be created. That's unfortunate. Lust is one of those defects that we have within that destroys, that is a squandering in a very stupid way, that energy that could be utilized in order to be born in the game, as the Bible talks. Because we have three brains. And to these three brains, the first one, which is a cerebrum spinal nervous system, is a throne of the spirit, the father. The energy of the first logos acts through the brain, spinal nervous system. The energy of the sun, which is the second part of the monad, acts to the emotional center, the emotional brain, which we have here in this area, from the heart to the navel. Unfortunately, we destroy the energy of, of the sun, which is love, in stupidities. We have a, a lot of defects that destroy that energy, in emotionally speaking. And this time, the youth. They are destroying that uh, with rock and roll in many, many ways, in any, any emotional way. Actors and actresses are experts in destroying the energy of the emotional brain. And of course, the sexual instinctive motor brain, which is located in this area in relation to the spinal column, but it is a sexual instinctive motor brain, it destroys. With the sexual abuse, 
with uh, different sports that are very uh, popular in these times. Remember that we always make a parenthesis here. We are, we are not against of exercising. It's good. But the different sports, people kill the motor brain just for um, a gold medal, a silver medal, just to show with their pride that they are better than anybody. Always the ego involved in it. So the intellectual animal is killing the possibilities of the creation of man within each one of us because the ego destroys the energy that we have in the three brains. And that's why we die. And of course, these three forces which are in the universe we are talking here because there are forces that are in the universe but in relation with our monad the primary force the secondary force and the neutral force are in the three brains and are in relation with our own particular Elohim that we have within and that we have to work with but that we are not doing the work these three primary forces are the main forces with which we have to work, which are the forces of God within and outside to, in order to create the human being. In different religions, you always find the same primary forces and different great masters, avatars, messengers that come and teach the same thing in order to guide. In Kabbalah, when you study the tree of life, you find the first triangle which points precisely divinity. Keter, Chochma, Bina, which translated into English is crown, wisdom, and understanding. Crown, wisdom, and understanding. In India, we uh, uh, find a very ancient religion of religion of Brahmins. And they call it the three primary forces, Brahma, Vishnu, Shiva. A forces which express themselves through every single creature in the universe which has three brains. But the only creature that destroys those forces in the universe that has three brains is the intellectual animal. Because the other creatures that are called angels, archangels, thrones, seraphims, cherubims, they don't destroy that force. They create and they become immortal because of those forces. Of course, in Hinduism, they don't call it angels, they call it divas or gods. And in, in the Judaism, they call it Malachim, or Malachim. Because you know that uh, in the planet Earth, there are seven Orthodox religions. And from these seven Orthodox religions, we find 5,000 sects. And it's very rare to find somebody that understands his own religion. Usually they are fighting against other religions. Ignoring that all religions are coming from the same source. If we study, for instance, here in America, the ancient religions of Mayans, Aztecs, and Incas, we find the same principles. With other names, of course. In India, they were, they were uh, engraving the symbols of these three primary forces in a very beautiful way. You see statues of Brahma, another statues of Vishnu and Shiva. But in America, they were doing the same thing. 
but not in a beautiful way like in India or like in ancient Greece. You see the, the beautiful monuments, there are statues that you find in Greece, Roman Empire, beautiful. But here in, among the Mayans, stones, very rustic stones. And they were engra engraving that in a very rustic way, but always given the symbol of the same thing. So if you go into Mexico or Central America or South America, you will find, of course, statues there of gods, they call it gods. And for instance, uh, uh, Ometecutli among the Aztecs is the first force. But Ometecutli, you, find, uh, you will find some statues there that are not so beautiful like in India or in Greece. And you find also the second force of, of these three primary forces, which is called Quetzalcoatl. And if you can go through the to pyramid of Quetzalcoatl in Mexico, you will find a serpent with feathers. Beautiful symbol of the second force. But the same thing. Because at the end, those three primary forces, they have no form. But in every religion, they give different forms in order to explain. Like in Kabbalah, for instance, they are against any form. They don't make any form. But if you read the Sohar, which is a Kabbalistic book, you will see how they describe the Father, the primary force, in which beautiful way, mm -hmm. as a human being, in the complete sense of the word. We have to understand that no matter what symbol, we have to comprehend that are symbols of the three primary forces and we don't have to mock any religion because unfortunately this is the time in which humanity, the ignorance, they mock the other creatures of nature. When somebody achieves the control of the three primary forces in himself or herself become a god or goddess. What is a god? What is a goddess? A, a single or an angel in other words. It's a creature that self-realizes himself who achieves the perfection of each of the parts of his own monad. Therefore, he is capable to work with the forces of the universe. But with, with, because when somebody is in tone with the forces of the universe, you can handle the <coughs> energies. You can handle the energies very well. It controls everything. Therefore, we have to understand that not all the creatures with three brains in the universe are so degenerated like us. Even though, uh, still in this time, uh, this let us call it this humanity, think that they are on top of everything. Just because, technologically speaking, the inventions of the intellectual mind are hypnotizing humanity, but in reality, we are not on top. Psychologically speaking, and even physically speaking, we are below of many creatures which are not intellectual. A lion, for instance, is almighty in front of any one of us. Even with all the our intellect and all the pride that we can show about uh, any, any one of us in front of a lion in one room, a real human being is capable of Controlling many lions, not only one, because a human being is above the lion. Read the book of uh, Bible Daniel, and you will see how Daniel, who is a real human being, was there in, in the den with many lions. Because he was a human being, a self-realized being. So any ego is above 
any one of us. <coughs> because really, even having three brains, we are degenerated. And the purpose of this doctrine is to regenerate, but we have to understand that the regeneration of each one of us, in order to achieve the goal of becoming human beings, is by taking advantage of the three brains. Because only Father, Son, and Holy Spirit creates. Only Brahma, Vishnu, Shiva creates. There is no way to achieve the self-realization of the being if we don't take advantage of the three brains. And the main force that can transform us is the sexual motor instinctive brain. If we are destroying the three brains in stupidities, we are not going to achieve the self-realization of the being. In other words, our mona will not succeed to express itself to each one of us. We have to perfect all the parts. Did you hear that in the ancient times, and still in this time, they are repeating, they say that the man, the real man, is the microcosmos of the macrocosmos. In other words, it is stated that the macrocosmos, the large cosmos, expresses itself through the micro, through our selves, supposedly. But is the macrocosmos expressing itself through us? What is expressing through ourselves? Be frank and talk to yourself. Do you know about the four, fifth, six and seven dimension because there are many intellectual animals that they say that this three dimensional world is the only world and that all the dimensions are just superstitions or beliefs of people that are ignorant they are not uh, very uh, instructed in knowledge we we'll say because they are blind we know that our psyche in this very moment is sick. It's easy. Just see the world, how the world is in this very moment. Wars, sicknesses. Humanity in the United States and Canada and other countries worshipping homosexuality, worshipping lesbianism. In order for a humanity or an intellectual animal in groups to worship the generation, just beautiful. But they justify their generation in many ways. They justify adultery, fornication, assassination. This is a chaos in which we are. We are sick. And this is something that we have to, to see, really. The monad is perfect. But unfortunately, it's not incarnated. We have to incarnate it. Each time that is passing, we are far away, far away from the monad. Because the opposite of the monad is the ego, which is an imperfect multiple unity. The ego. Is divided in three as well as the modern three. We have, for instance, in the mind an entity that is very intellectual, but in many religions is called with different names. In the ancient Egypt, this entity in the mind, very intellectual and wise, was called Hai. And Moses represented this demon high, demon of the mind, in his book, The Exodus. And he placed this demon as a pharaoh. 
But that's Moses. Because if we investigate the, in the wisdom of Egypt, and the symbol of a Pharaoh is different. But because Moses was establishing a new religion in his time, of course, he was taking many symbols and destroying others in order to establish his own religion, or his own doctrine. And he plays uh, uh, the Pharaoh there, and he has to fight with it. It's the, 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 the demon high, it's called, in the ancient Egypt, besides in the mind. In the Gospels, the four uh, writers of the Gospels, they put this demon high as Pilate, the one that is washing his hands and sending Jesus to the cross. But this Pilate or high is always in our mind. Of course, you find this three parts of traitors, which are called, or the inner monad, symbolized in different ways. If you ever read a Popol book, the book of the Mayans, it's very uh, uh, beautiful to find there uh, the symbol, the three demons as well, three entities that everyone has inside in different ways. And then we have another entity here in the emotional plane, I mean the emotional brain, that is called Nept in the ancient Egypt. They said the demon Nept, N E B M T. No, no M, just T. Nept. And of course, in, the, in Christianity, they call it uh, uh, Caiphas, the priest, the, the Pharisee, which is very hypocrite. That resides always in this area. But Caiphas, the Pharisee, the priest, is very strong in all religious people that call themselves religious, but they are not. And of course, Judas is in the, this area. A poppy is called in ancient Egypt. The demon of desire, the most degenerated of all of them. But we have them, the three, three entities that work through in our consciousness. And we have these three entities or three demons or three traitors, which are related with the three brains. We find the seven capital sins. Uh, I, I remember right now that the book of Revelation called these three uh, demons three filthy spirits with a form of frog that were coming from the false prophet the eagle of course so behind these three we find lust pride envy greed Anger, gluttony, laziness, the seven capital sins, or the dragon of seven heads, which is inside of everybody. And behind the seven legions of psychological aggregates that nourish themselves in each one of us. So the ego is plurality, it's multiple. So the way that we are, that we are uh, a chaos, walking, and of course, as the monad is male-female, also we find here the two polarities, male-females. Inside of us, if we investigate some psychological aggregates with clairvoyance, we will discover that some egos are male and others are female. And they reside in that that we call subconsciousness, unconsciousness, or infraconsciousness, which is our own particular individual hell, in other words. Or as in Latin we say, infernus, 
which means inferior, inferior, inferior part of the consciousness. So, whether we carry the monad inside, heaven, or whether we carry the ego inside, hell. And of course, since we carry hell, the ego inside, we exteriorize that ego in our activities. And because the almost five billion of inhabitants in the earth express them their, their own hell, so see the planet Earth as a hell. A completely generated planet. But the ego dares to believe that this planet is inhabited by human beings is what the ego say. And probably, if there is life in other planets, too much arrogance to think that only this planet is inhabited and the rest is just for our destruction, right? If there is life in other countries, intelligent life, well, there will be like, you see, in order to synthesize, see the Star Trek New Generation, you will understand. Very ugly creatures, but not so beautiful like we are. Right? I don't see any beauty in us, really. Mm -hmm. Psychologically speaking, we are very ugly. Very ugly. Other creatures which are not intellectual, like the lion, tiger, and other wild beasts, they kill when they are hungry. But they don't kill for stupidities a flag, or because they are hypnotized with that word, liberty. <coughs> so there are many people that believe themselves that they are free. Free of what? We are slaves. We are slaves of our own defects, our own vices. If we were kings and queens of nature in the universe, as human beings should be, then we wouldn't have cancer, AIDS, leukemia, or that uh, last disease that is appearing there that is just eating in one day a limb of the body or any part of the body. But even though, with all of this, we are busting of being human beings and very, very intelligent creatures. And because we are so intelligent, we are destroying the planet with smog, polluting the seas, rivers, lakes, destroying nature and believing ourselves intelligent, intelligent creatures. Intelligence is related to the Holy Spirit, Bina. The Holy Spirit, the energy that creates, is in the sexual organs. We ignore about the sexual energy, we don't know anything about it. We, we, the only thing that we know is how to enjoy in the bestial way the sexual or the sexual energy. Is it because of the animal things that we have within? If we awake just for a moment and we have the opportunity to investigate other creatures in the other kingdoms, we will see how the how, how innocent they are the purity that they have. Yeah, they are awakened. You see that uh, the so-called elementals of nature or the creatures of other kingdoms like animals, plants and minerals they are more of course in tone in union with nature. Therefore, they are enjoying Eden, in other words, the paradise. Eden is a state of consciousness in which the being, the soul, is united with the spirit, is united with Elohim. When the soul, which is the lowest of all the parts, in other words, we are the lowest of all the parts of Elohim. But we are bottled up into the ego, unfortunately. But an animal, would you see an animal like a cat, 
a fox, they are only instinctively. But they are united with the monad in communion. And they enjoy nature. And some of them they are not enjoying it because the intellectual animal is destroying it. But still they are in communion with the higher forces. And even with those beings which are above us, which are called angels, archangels, and many other names in different religions that exist. They are self-realized beings, capable of creating more com complex elements or units in the universe. There are beings, for instance, that are called Cosmo Creators. You know what a Cosmo Creator is? A Cosmo Creator, as the word points us, is a creator of cosmos. Cosmoses. An entity capable of creating any cosmos. And there are seven cosmos in the universe. The tribe of cosmos, which is the lowest of all the cosmos, which is called in, uh, in English hell, the tribe of cosmos, hell, is the lowest of all the cosmos. This is which we are right now. This is what we are creating, hell. But above this hell, is a microcosmos. Very, very far for our understanding. But for a being, a monad, to create a, a planet, a mesocosmos, you need to go beyond the micro. <laughs> Difficult to understand. Because we are not human beings. We are just tritocosmoses. Infernoses of hells walking around in the planet Earth. But a human being can understand about that because he's in contact. Above the Mesa cosmos, we find a deutero cosmos. Yes. And there are beings which are capable of controlling a Mesa cosmos, solar system. And above the solar system, there are beings capable of controlling macrocosmoses, galaxies. And above the galaxy, beings that are capable to control protocosmoses. This is what we call cosmic creators. But since we are not uh, capable of seeing beyond the third dimension, we mock them. This is what this humanity does. Humanity mocks the holy gods. And they think that the gods of different religions were created by the imagination of the ancient people because they couldn't answer the different phenomena of nature. Therefore, they created different gods explaining that the lightning was coming from Jupiter, that the rain, for instance, in ancient Mexico, they said that the ancients were believing that Flalok was causing the rain etc. And in their ignorance, they say, they engrave many monuments and many statues in order to symbolize their gods. The answer is simple. The ancients were not so degenerated like us. And they were capable of seeing these beings that we are talking here. And they call it they call them gods, masters, whatever. It doesn't matter the name. Beings that were in communion more with their inner monad, Elohim, in the complete sense of the word. And of course, they were seeing them and worshipping them because they were longing that in the future they will become as one of them in their path of perfection, of civilization. Because as in the universe, 
It's a path in many levels in that ladder. But it's very difficult for the worm or the slug which is wallowing in the mud to understand it. But out of that mud is beautiful flowers, trees. The slack only believes in the mud because it's always within. And this is a lack, unfortunately. We are so, so degenerated, so below, that we think that we are the top. And they are even, I hear one day in, uh, in, in TV, a religious statement of a fanatical fundamentalist that they say, that I don't know the purpose of God. Maybe we that believe in Jesus, that we are saved in the rapture, maybe God will take us in order for us to colonize other planets or to govern other humanities that maybe we are there because we are the chosen ones. <laughs> so it's what they believe, that if there are humanities in other planets, well, we are the chosen ones. We are preparing here in order to control them there, to be kings, you know, because the Lord Christ is promising. This is what they understand when they read the Bible. Unfortunately, it's not like that. Mm -hmm. So we have to climb the mystical, cabalistical ladder of Jacob, according to Kabbalah. They take us from the matter to the spirit, from hell to heaven. But that ladder has to climb with three forces, by acting with three energies. That's why, in order to acquire the self-realization of the being, we need to work with three factors. Not two, not one, three. You don't work with three, and then we are not working with the three brains. We are just wasting our time and fooling ourselves. Because the most stupid way of fooling one, uh, somebody is when you are fooling yourself. Thinking that you are doing good. Meanwhile, you don't know that you are not doing anything. The first factor of the revolution of the consciousness starts there, below, here, in this brain to work with this brain, which is to be born again. And to be born again is when you know how to utilize the sexual energy and need to create in the alchemical way. It's not a matter of believing in Jesus. If you believe in Jesus and know the prophets of the Bible and you memorize the Bible letter by letter, but you don't take advantage of sexual energy knowing to be born again, you are just wasting your time. Even if you cry and feeling in your heart with all of your strength that you are saved and you are born again, you are not. Because birth in this physical plane takes over when a woman and a man have sexual act. And when the sperm leaves the sexual organ of the male and penetrates the ovum in the sexual organ of the female. This is something natural. To be born again is not something artificial or believing in nothing. It's utilizing the sexual energy, creating inside of us something which is called the son of man. Son of man has to be created. If the son of the human being, the son of man. Jesus did it. But he did it. And he teach, and he taught that 2,000 years ago, in order for every one of his followers to do the same thing that he did, with the help of Christ. He didn't believe that he was the only one. He knew that he was one of many. Very high, yeah. Very elevated. But Christ saved him. And Christ is not Jesus himself. Jesus is part of Christ. But Christ is a multiple perfect unity in the universe. It's a force. 
an energy that expresses himself or itself through the three brains. Because Christ is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Christ is positive, negative, neutral. Christ is Brahma, Vishnu, Shiva. Keter, Chokmah, Bina. Active force, passive force, neutral force. So that's one of the aspects to take advantage of the sexual force, to be born again. Second factor of this, these three primary forces of the universe, you have to deny yourself in order for the energy or, or the force of that beautiful energy which is called the sun, the second aspect of Christ, to crystallize in each one of us. To deny yourself, to deny that that you think you are, to deny your lust, to deny your envy, your greed, your gluttony, all that. But not just denying it as many superficial people do. They say, I don't sing anymore, therefore I'm a virtue person. Or virtuous, in other words. Right? They call virtues. To be tired of seeing. That is not a virtue. And somebody, for instance, is drunk and stopped drinking, now he believes to be a virtuous because he doesn't drink anymore. But the ego, the entity that was pushing him to drink is still there. So where is the virtue? Somebody was tired of fornicating. Now, now they believe themselves that they are chaste. They are not chaste. We have to annihilate lust in the three brains, in all the 49 levels of the mind, in order to become really without virtue, which is chastity. And some people call chaste person if, if this person has no sexual activity. That's just abstinence. It's not chastity. To be abstinent, abst how do you call abstinent? Abstinent is easy. Everybody can do it. All the priests of the Catholic Church do it. But they are not chaste, they are just abstinent in celibacy. Like many monks in Buddhism that take Buddhism in the wrong way, they are also, also celibate. But they are not chaste. Chaste person is somebody that is in chastity in all of the levels of the mind. Somebody that is not squandering the sexual energy, neither in the physical plane, nor in the emotional plane, never in the mental plane. Because somebody can be, oh, I am single, I am in chastity, I, I am celibate. Meanwhile, he's going to and reading pornographic magazines, or having lots of conversations, or having wet dreams. So where is his chastity? There's no chastity there. The only way to acquire chastity is an iron lust. To reach that moment when somebody tells you, what about lust? And then you will, will answer, what is that? I do not understand. Can you explain unto me what is last? To reach the innocence of a child? A child of one year old? Because in this humanity now, the children of five, seven year old, they are all they are masterful. The, that innocence is very rare to find a boy of seven years or five. Three years old, somebody was telling me, I remember in this very moment, he told me, and really I was amazing that he told me that, that he started masturbating himself at the age of four years. What? Yes. And I knew, and I enjoyed it. Since the four years old, I said, well, four years old. And you were masturbating? No, yeah. And I liked it. But what are you obtaining at four years old? I don't know. But some sensation. Until, of course, the old age. God. What a lust. In, their, in his particular ego. And like him, there, there will be many. I don't think that he is a, a how you call, a singular or an exception. There will be many like him. 
and my kid was surprised because at the age of four years old I wasn't thinking things like that. And when somebody is a very lustful soul in many lives, suddenly that in the last life that they are having, like right now, a lot of souls that are incarnated right now, they are coming from ancient times. And in each life, degenerating and degenerating themselves, sexually speaking, now they are very fat, lots of speaking. And they are being born as homosexuals and lesbians because the lust is so big that they even take the body in the wrong way. But they are being born and they have the daring of saying, God made me like that. It's their lust that are making them like that. Because every, anybody that is abusing of the sexual energy in previous lives is being born as an homosexual or lesbian. Mm-hmm. Trying to enjoy other sources because he's tired of the other opposite sex. But not only lust, anger, envy, hatred, just causing it. We have to deny that. That implies to know how to meditate. Meditation. We learn to know ourselves. And to receive a lot of help. Because we need help. That's why we are in this doctrine. We need help. And of course, because we need help, we give help. Because this is a law in the universe. If you want knowledge, you want to be helped, but you don't help, and then you are not working in accordance with the, with the first law of the Father, which is the law of the self struggle auto ego cracking cosmic coming to give and to receive in a harmonious way in the beginning of course we start in the selfish way we give because we know that we have to receive but later on we know how to give without expecting to receive but the law always will give us in return that will be in the higher way in which we, with compassion, we are given. And we are not expecting anything, but the love will return anyhow. But you don't give anything. That's called, uh, in Buddhism, the Pratyeka path, or selfish path, in which the individual, not the doctrine, but working only for himself like an av- avaricious person, you know, you know, it doesn't mean anything. We have to give if we want to receive. That's why the third factor, the sacrifice for humanity. Sacrifice for humanity means to do the sacred work for humanity for that human thing which is inside of each person not for the ego because I repeat since we have the wrong idea that we are humans there are a lot of people there that are sacrificing themselves that are given to the ego there is no sacrifice for humanity the ego destroys the fire and the energy of the father only the human part of us is the one that wants to return to do the religare, the religion with our being. So this doctrine helps. You see, I'm talking to the consciousness, but I, I, I'm talking against you, really. I really don't care about your lust, your pride, and you feel hurt in your self-esteem. What the heck? That's going to hell you are any, anyhow. If you don't like it, well, it's going there. But I care for your soul, for your consciousness. That has nothing to do with your self-esteem, with your pride, with your vanity, with your laziness, gluttony, lust, anger, and all of that bunch of garbage that we have inside. Because I have that too. I don't want to boss him you know, to say that I'm a saint. I'm not a saint. I am somebody like you too. With ego. But I work in my own self. And I want to work for my being. I'm sacrificing everything for my being. Therefore, 
in the same way that I love my being, my God, I love my neighbor. That is a word for, for humanity, for God, but a word for love. Not in the wrong way that many people think. We have to be compassionate. And to tolerate degeneration, that's stupid. That's why this humanity is as it is. Because we are tolerating other groups that there are there. We have to be compassionate. And we have to see and to tolerate degeneration. That's a very, we call a backward psychology. Going the wrong way. So every one of us has something to give. Something to give. But remember, that that you want to give has to be always for the conscience, for the human part, for that essence which is pure, for the inner child. And then you will receive in return also for the higher forces. But you start giving for, your, for the ego of other people, you, they will return to you for your own ego too and then you are working not for your being for, for your ego and then you will want to uh, to have a cult the cult for the ego is what right now is everywhere they have a cult for the ego but not for the being in order to have service to the being you have to hate yourself that self that you love too much, which is your ego. That is to deny yourself. And as Jesus says, take your cross or follow me. You, see? you want to see an example of somebody that is sacrificing himself only for the human part? Read the gospel. And Jesus is an example. He's never worshipping any weakness of anybody it's always against the ego taking the demons out of the people but we love our demons we don't want to we don't want to hear anybody here saying that we are demons and we have devils inside right? we want to be in heaven with all the demons that we have inside in other words religions in this time they promise to their followers to put their hell in heaven after death. We don't promise that here. We have to destroy hell in order to be in heaven. But whether we are in heaven or in hell, in the physical body or out of the physical body, is what we want to conquer heaven here, in this physical plane. Which means to incarnate the monad, to perfect all the parts of the monad. The civilization of being inside of each one of us. And you said before the cerebral spinal is the throne of the father, the emotional brain is the energy of the son. What was the other one? And well, the, the emotional brain, which is called the grand sympathetic nervous system, is the a, a, is a seat of the sun, of that energy which is called the sun. And the parasympathetic. It's also called vagus nervous system. Is uh, is uh, the chair of the Holy Spirit, mm-hmm. the sexual organs. You said being born again is um, creating the Son of Man. Is there? How would you distinguish between the Son of Man and the Son of God as between the Do the same, same thing. Son of God and Son of Man is. A, but we have to understand uh, two things. The Son of God, which is Christ. Is that energy which is in the universe, diluted in the universe. It's the first emanation of the unknown, that light, precise in the center of every atom, every galaxy, every solar system, every planet, is the light, Son of God. But when that energy, which is Christ, which is called the Son of God, humanizes in every single creature and then becomes the Son of Man. When that Son of God is entering, for instance, in his incarnate in our body, is son of, son of Man. That's why Jesus Christ is called the Son of Man, has power, because Christ was within him as the Son of Man. But this Son of Man was also within Moses, 
Moses was having his own son of man inside. Krishna is a son of man too. But because the son of man is the same Christ, humanized, in the same essence of the universal Christ. So if we call the son of man the son of God, the same. Son of God, son of man is Jesus, is Moses, is Krishna, is Babaji, is Rama, is uh, Mohammed. And every single three brain creature that incarnate the three forces. And the three traitors, you've got Nept is kindness, Apopi is Judas, what's the third one? Uh, Judas. Judas. Apopi is Judas. Apopi is Judas. Right. High is Pilot. Hmm? Pilot. High? High. H-H-A-O-I. H-A-I. High is Pilot, which is the governor, according to the Gospels, that is sending Jesus to the cross, right? And you said the demon of desire is Judas. Judas is the demon of desire. Pilate is the demon of the mind, and Nept or Caiaphas is the demon of the evil will. Or self-willed demon. Well, these three demons are inside of each one of us. They reside in the three brains. It's those the three entities which are uh, acting always against the self-realization. They destroy the energy because every single day when we fall asleep and what we eat too, the three brains are charged. So which is and the demon of the mind is in, char- in, char- in charge of destroying the energy of the mind. No, no, no. Judas is possessing the sex. Judas, is, I said, is the most degenerated of the three. Judas likes homosexuality. Judas likes lesbianism. Judas likes prostitution. Judas likes any type of sexual degeneration. And Caiaphas is the... Caiaphas is in the heart, in this area. And he's a hypocrite. He, believed, he believes himself holy. Yeah, this yeah. it represents that type of ego that we have yeah. that we believe that, that we are holy because we belong to this type of religion of this death, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. That's why in this in this doctrine when you enter here, you don't expect to find any holy person. We are not holy. Every single person has ego here and we know that. But in other groups, they ignore about that. They think that they are holy because they are believing in something. So they are strengthening that part of the, the ego in this area of the heart, which is called the hypocrite Pharisee. Right? Believe themselves holy, and meanwhile they are full of garbage inside. But to recognize that is important. Because always when, when in, in this area, when we feel ourselves more, you know, you said, me, myself, I, and then you point that. Okay? What I feel is that you know, most of the time we feel in the wrong way. And of course here in the mind is that demon that washes his hand with justifications. Oh, I did it because, you know, I, 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 maybe tomorrow I will do it. But now I don't think so. Is you have a justification of not doing the work of his inner being with any, any, any justification will come always from the mind. All the, I have too much work to do. All the difficulties, you know, I try, but... <laughs> right? Or about meditation. Oh, no, no, it's very difficult. Every time that I meditate, it's very complicated, so forget it. So always you find a justification for not doing what you have to do. Mm-hmm. Behind these, um, the three demons, of desire, the mind and the will. Do we have um, the seven capital sins behind each three and behind those seven capital forty nine levels of the mind in three different places? Yeah. 
How do you suggest to meditate? By what methods? What? By what methods do you suggest to meditate? By what practice? Meditation is, of course, the way in which you have to discover the facts, right. the true, the truth inside. First hand. Yeah. So you have to know how to relax your body and, of course, to concentrate in that particular part of yourself that you want to comprehend. Remember that you have many parts. So different methods for different parts. Well, the same method, always. Yeah. Same method. You but you cannot comprehend all the parts of yourself in one session. So you have to have the patience of comprehending each part of yourself in every day. Could you describe the method which you feel is effective? For instance, uh, capture, comprehension, annihilation. Capture. I explained that all of the defects, vices, and errors express themselves from the three brains. So you have to observe the three brains. The 24 hours of the day, or at least 16 hours, I don't know how many hours you sleep, right? That you are aware, you have to observe. And in order to observe yourself, you have to remember your inner God, your inner being, the positive part of you, which is God, and to pray. There are many ways of praying. Right? It depends what religion do you have. There are many prayers that, for instance, Christianity, the prayer of the Lord, or in, 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 in Hinduism, it's a very simple way, just om, 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 and you remember. You remember your inner being. And at the same time, you observe. Observe what? Any difficult will act. Because if somebody comes and insults you, and then the anger will come. And then you have to be in a state of alertness, in order to see which brain is going to act that anger. In your intellect, by justifying it, in your emotional, by exploding, right, like an atomic bomb, or kicking, utilizing your, your motor center, and even, <laughs> even punching the face of the other one, right? <coughs> Always acts in any of the three brains. But when it takes one brain, it means it takes the other two. This is how you have to understand. It doesn't matter which brain is acting the first time, in the first moment, but after that, takes the other two and acts with the three brains. You see? And of course, if you are that in that way, then you have material for meditation. At any time of the day, you sit and you analyze that attitude, that behavior of you, in your mind, in your heart, in your sex. When you are satisfied with your comprehension, and then you ask for annihilation of that particular aggregate, psychological aggregate. But in order to ask for annihilation, you have to worship the feminine aspect of God in you, which is something that is a lot of religions are lacking in that. In Hinduism, for instance, is is very rich in that. They call the divine part divine mother Kundalini. That's the feminine aspect. In Kabbalah, they call it Shekinah. Mm -hmm. the, the, the feminine aspect that you have to work in order to ask for annihilation, and of course, to utilize Tantra. Mm -hmm. White Tantra. Mm -hmm. Not that black Tantra which you find in bookstores, written by Rajnish and many other black magicians that are teaching black Tantra, which is just the joint of lust. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. White Tantra is different. It is very difficult to find a book of White Tantra. Can we recommend it? We have one, but we don't have copies right now. It's called The Perfect Matrimony. Mm -hmm. We have all the books. But outside in the bookstores, I, I found only Black Tantra and Grey Tantra. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately. And that's the way in order to annihilate, right? The meditation has to be daily. And, and never ending. Never ending, because... The daily bread of the wise is meditation. But you have to know yourself. And the only way to, learn to know yourself is through meditation. First, you know hell. And then, after that, heaven. There are a lot of people that want to enter and they say, I want to experience heaven, heaven. Meanwhile, hell is very large. So I'm sorry, but if you want to experience heaven, you have to annihilate a lot of your hell. So, 
they don't let them um, transmit their sexual energy. That's part of the house to um, the sexual energy. Yeah, for celibacy? Yeah. yeah. Celibacy is good yeah, for awesome. those people that know how to sublimate the sexual energy, mm -hmm. being single. Mm -hmm. In order to prepare, because we have to prepare ourselves in order to find the real, the, the real mate, the right mate. Mm -hmm. But it's not the mate there, so don't jump immediately, because you can take the wrong mate, right? So just practice as a single, as a single. When you find a mate, and then the tantra. But that mate has to be uh, not just for a while. Like it is, it's now, is very common in those times, right? That uh, people change mates like changing underwear, mm -hmm. right? And in this world, we have to be serious. Unless the underwear is old. <laughs> well, dead, well, it's okay, right? But uh, because this is serious work, and we are working with energies, it's very serious. It's not just to be here, there, and everywhere, right? Because then we are not, we are just wasting time, too. Mm -hmm. Do you um, confront one of your egos in the astral, and you're not afraid of it, and you realize at the time? that it's an ego, can you, can it hurt you, can you, str can you fight with it there and try to annihilate it there, or what do you do, do you talk to it, what, what do you do? Sometimes you can there, talk, right? if you have a strong energy, you can talk with your own ego, mm. but uh, if it's an ego that is very strong, the ego will be smarter than you and will keep his mouth shut. Unless if you conjure and conjure and force him to talk. Because if they talk, they will tell you in the, in the way that they are feeling themselves through you. Mm. Mm. But then, yeah, but then when you conjure them, then they try to hurt me. Well, if it's a strong ego, it will try to hurt you, of course. Yeah. It will be you hurting you. Right? Like, uh, I remember one day, for instance, I was in the astral plane and I was having difficulties with a certain ego. Mm -hmm. And then I uh, concentrated myself in my inner mother and I told her, my Divine Mother, please invoke me, my such, such ego. I want to talk with this ego of mine. And of course, my Divine Mother brought my psychological defect in front of me. And in the beginning I was, you know, very surprised because I was observing him, the ego in front of me, it was exactly like me. Mm. You see, exactly like me. No difference. Like watching myself in front of a mirror. When the only difference, that he was having very red eyes, very red, like umbers, you know. And then I told the ego, I invoke you in order to, for you to tell me, in which way are you feeling yourself through me? And then the creature, the beast, which was myself, was attacking me. It was with a lot of anger, throwing myself against me. Myself against me. And uh, when I was a teenager, I was learning karate and judo. You know? Somehow it was funny, because I was uh, taking advantage of that knowledge in the astral plane and I was taking him because I didn't, want, I didn't want to conjure him because I know that if I conjure this ego he will flee away mm -hmm. so I was taking him and doing certain movement of judo and putting him in other place I said don't fight because I don't want to hurt you are you I want you to tell me in which way are you feeling yourself to me and then he attacked me again like three times the fourth time I said, maybe with a conjuration, and I conjure him, right? And he said, in the name of Christ, I conjure you. And he disappeared. Mm -hmm. He said, oh God. And then I did it again, you know, and appeared again. And I said, don't fight, because I can feel you as you see. Just tell me in which way are you feeling yourself. I command you to do it. Because of my own ego, you know. 
and he was always shut up. He turned away and was transforming himself in a certain different person, right? It was not myself, but it was another one. And somehow I was discovering that the ego has the ability of transforming himself in the way that we want in order to take advantage of you when you are dreaming. But do you know the, 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 the person that he kept trying, did you recognize these different shapes that he was taking as people that you No. Were? It was somebody that he didn't know. Mm. And he was just walking away and then I just gave up. I said, I mean, this, this guy, <laughs> he knows that he, tell, you know, he talks, is his death. Mm-hmm. Because then you take advantage of that and you are, uh, comprehend more, right? And when is the ego, but sometimes when the ego is uh, not uh, too strong, they can talk. They may tell you. And there are many, but we have many psychological languages. Yeah, but sometimes they don't, sometimes they can't even work. <coughs> when they come like you, I think it's not so bad. When they come like you, it's when they come like a, <laughs> like a, a house of monster. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. you know? But you have, listen then, you have always to pray to your Divine Mother. Do not forget your Divine Mother Kundalini. She is the one that will help you to understand, to comprehend, because she knows every single one of them. But she knows it, but you don't. And the work is this. You have to know yourself. This is what your Divine Mother wants. To you to know yourself. So when you go in meditation deep and, and, and then you concentrate, because it's you and, and how, it's your consciousness, which is divided in many parts. So when you concentrate in you and don't forget yourself and you go deep down, digging in one of the parts of yourself, it will be, for instance, anger or any type of anger, you know that part of you. And then you are knowing. So when you ask your Divine Mother, please annihilate this psychological aggregate of mine, because your mother knows very well the aggregate, she will know if you really know. And he look at you and say, oh, it's a little bit that you need more to know about that. So he, she will not annihilate it mm-hmm. until you know it. And then, annihilating defect, you don't feel anymore. And then the virtue comes, which will be the opposite of that. So how does it get you? So in the beginning, like I mean, you have so many egos, and like you said, one brain might act, but all three unite after that. So there's so many things happening. How can you possibly really understand? Like you're observe, just observe. No, I know, but you're, how do you know that you really understand every aspect of it? Because it could be a multiple amount um, of you know egos that are playing yeah. in that one incident. You know, so you might be analyzing. You have to be patient. Mm-hmm. If you discover that there are three defects acting in the same moment, take one first and comprehend this one in your three brains. Mm-hmm. If you are satisfied that you comprehended that part, take the other one. And do the same thing with this one. And then the, the third one. And then when you are satisfied that the three ones are completely comprehended, and then ask for annihilation of the same ones in the same sequence. Mm-hmm. And they will be annihilated. But because you comprehend them. But you have to comprehend them, because mm-hmm. if you don't comprehend them, if you ask for annihilation, they will be there. Mm-hmm. Because your consciousness is buckled up. Mm-hmm. See, the, the, the divine part, the divine mother, takes the defect out and pushes them to, to hell. Mm-hmm. I mean, it puts this defect in the inferior regions of nature. Where it gets purified? No, the ego, the ego will not be purified, it will be annihilated, because it's just a demon. Yeah. Right. It's an that the only thing that the ego deserves is death. But when you comprehend an ego, you take the consciousness out of the ego. It's what you do. A comprehended ego is like the genius of the lamp. Out, it's not there. No longer in, in the in the bottle of the lamp. And then your divine mother comes and kills the lamp or, or the or the bottle. Mm-hmm. But if you said I comprehended this, meanwhile the genie is inside of the bottle. So the Divine Mother is not going to kill the battle because then we will kill the genie too as part of you. So comprehension takes the genie out. So it's only an empty shell that gets this. Yeah, the empty shell. But even though that empty shell doesn't want to die, and will act through you as a tempting demon. In order 
to force you to repeat the sin that was causing it to be. And if you repeat that sin, and then the consciousness will be bottled up again. You know? And that's just a play, a, a stupid game. Once you've understood it, you can do it again, you bring it back. Yeah. So you really can't free yourself then because you've already understood it and the understanding doesn't free it. No. You have to ask for annihilation. Your divine mother had to annihilate that empty bottle. If you don't ask for annihilation of that empty bottle, that empty bottle will act as a tempting demon. And you already know that you, you shouldn't have you, you, you shouldn't do that. But meanwhile, the ego will act just do it, do it, do it, do it, do it. You know, like the little devil in your left side of your shoulder. <laughs> and finally, it's like, oh, what the heck? And then, psh, swallow your consciousness again. But what does the matter if that temptation is no longer it's there? It's not there because it's, mm-hmm. it's, not, it's, yeah. it's not evident, it's not temptation. Yeah, but they hide that, don't they? <coughs> Sometimes I think if you go to, if there's something you think, okay, you know, you went to the wrong, no meditation. And then comes to your meditation, it runs, and it hides, and it's almost like it knows you're coming, you're getting closer to it, so it kind of... Yeah, I know, it hides, or put your mind in other things, so you, you have to pray to your Divine Mother, mother my Mother, my God, help me, please, help me, please. <laughs> right? <laughs> the meditation is a very serious matter, you know, it's not just like people think to sit there and to close your eyes and feel nice. <laughs> no. It's a battle, you have to know, it's a struggle. Trying to control your mind, because really the mind is the den of your defects. And we have many beasts there, thousands. You see, imagine you enter in a den and you found in ten thousand beasts, yeah, and you have to kill, <laughs> and all of them are part of you. And in the mind, mind, My, yeah. You know what? For instance, in the Bible, you talk that. There are many types of uh, levels in the initiation. Shaul, the king Shaul, Shaul, Saul, killed thousand, but David, his ten thousand. So Saul, Shaul, uh, the king Saul, reached certain level, you know, in the annihilation. But David came and he annihilated more, so he was bigger than him. about what you learned in this lecture, we invite you to explore the books published by Gloria and Publishing, available from booksellers worldwide. You may also be interested in online courses or upcoming retreats, all of which you can learn about at GnosticTeachings.org. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Will you help others to benefit from this knowledge? Most spiritual schools recommend a donation of $10 to $20 per lecture. Every donation helps. Make a donation now at GnosticTeachings.org. Thank you. May all beings be happy. Amen.